Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the uh, first first ever virtual black fitness um, virtual black senior fitness fair. I truly appreciate you uh, taking time on your busy lives to join us today. Uh, today we have on our panel Dr. Selvin Nanan and Dr. George Love. They come to us uh, with a long histories of working in both. Uh, practical uh, allopathic medicine, as well as uh, alternative medicine. And they will provide for us incredible insight on how, how these things can be leveraged for the health and fitness of seniors in our communities. Um, so the way this is going to go, and this is for my panelists as well, is that um, after introducing yourselves, I have a series of questions that I'll be posing and I'll uh, let you both know, you know, who I'm addressing to, but I'd like it to be very conversational. I'd like it to be a, a dialogue between the two of you and myself uh, regarding those questions. Uh, and, um, I'll, and I'll guide the time, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the time, and um, we'll have a wonderful time and be able to uh, have a lot of great information for people when they're ready. Okay? Does that sound good? Sounds good enough. All right, cool. Okay, I'd like to start with Dr. Nanan. If you can uh, give us a, a brief bio, a bio of yourself and tell us a little about yourself and uh, what brings you to, what, what brought you to medicine and, and just share your experience. Well, uh, just very briefly, I'm sort of semi-retired mm -hmm. uh, in general medical practice. I uh, started my career uh, teaching medical students and residents, interns and residents in New York, and then uh, got tired of the coal and came down to Florida, where mm -hmm. I also did a private practice in the plantation uh, region. And then I gave that up uh, around 90, uh, 2005, 2006. And I've been doing voluntary work since uh, at a free clinic uh, called Light of the World Clinic, located mm -hmm. in Fort Lauderdale, yeah, nice. Oakland Park mm -hmm. region. And I also still do part-time teaching. I teach at the Institute, uh, the Atlantic Institute of Oriental Medicine in Fort Lauderdale. So in a nutshell, that's what I do right now. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Love, you can give us a little bit about yourself. Um, I started off uh, as a massage therapist and 1974. I went to uh, acupuncture school in 1980. Um, I started working at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx in 1981. In 1982, I met uh, Master Lee, and over wow. the next 10 years, I became a uh, Qigong master in the family lineage of the uh, Longqing Qigong. And then in 1990, I moved to Florida and opened um, the uh, Love Chinese Medicine Clinic. I went on to teach acupuncture school uh, from 1992 to 2002. So I taught acupuncture school for 10 years. And mm -hmm. so uh, Qigong has been my primary focus the last five years. I still mm -hmm. have an acupuncture clinic. I lecture all over the world. Uh, I teach uh, in like six foreign countries. I have students in 16 foreign countries. Um, the medical Qigong that I teach is specifically for longevity, which is mm -hmm. preventing the uh, suffering of old age. Wow. So uh, I just turned 71. And I'm the poster boy for my own uh, teachings. <laughs> Must be nice. Uh, we had someone earlier who said, keep moving so you can keep moving from our earlier panel. So that is, yes. your testimony to that, huh? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you all. Thank you both once again. So I'm going to get started with the questions. Uh, this is a simple one. I'm going to start pretty simple. I'd like you both mm -hmm. to share from your uh from just from your understanding and your practices, uh, why water is so important when it comes to uh, weight management 
and uh, healthy ma the maintenance of health. Okay, and I'll start with Dr. Nanan. Good health is extremely important. It impacts on the way we live, uh, how we feel, and our overall happiness. Uh, weight management is extremely, extremely uh, a big problem uh, right now as we face it. There's a significant percentage of the population that are overweight or frankly obese. And with that comes an epidemic of type two diabetes. And the ramifications of that are uh, there's an overwhelming, overwhelming increase of cardiovascular diseases, uh, renal uh, kidney disease, and so forth. And as uh, you may know, or perhaps do know already, that the leading cause of mortality is cardiovascular disease, that means heart attacks and strokes in Western uh, countries. And obesity plays a very, very big role in this. Uh, a lot of people may not realize too that it impacts uh, cancer. Obese patients are at a higher risk for cancer. We know this for certain, we've documented this for many years that patients who are obese or overweight have an increased risk for breast cancer. So that's extremely important. Exercise, which I know you focused on this morning, physical exercise, a recent study just came out that men who exercise regularly have a decreased incidence of prostate cancer as opposed to those who are sedentary. So weight management is extremely important as, and of course exercise uh, has to go in there as well. Uh, I'd like to throw in, since I do integrative medicine, uh, we emphasize a lot on exercise, physical exercise. Uh, no, 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 let me make this clear. I'm not saying that's not necessary. It's absolutely necessary. And I cannot uh, overstate that. However, we tend to neglect that the human being is body, mind, and soul, or spirit, if so, as some people say. And we need to nourish the other aspects and also to exercise those as well, because a lot of diseases arise from having an unhealthy mind. And of course, uh, if we don't become spiritual, we can increase our chances for uh, diseases like cancer. I had to throw that in, being an integrative medical practitioner. Definitely uh, understood and definitely appreciated. It makes perfect sense. It, it actually is an alignment with uh, what came forth in our previous panel. So definitely uh, uh, the issues of, of uh, the mindset. Yeah, but we can address that later. I really wanna get uh, Dr. Love's view on water and uh, maintenance of health and weight management. So number one, I tell everybody they need to drink at least uh, three liters of water a day. I tell people that the point of drinking water is not to benefit the kidneys, but to dilute the amount of toxins so the kidneys don't have to work as hard and the kidneys are not damaged from filtering toxins when there's not enough fluid. We know that 71% of the body is water and the majority of that is interstitial fluid. They just discovered that interstitial fluid was responsible for connective tissue and fascia, and that the interstitial fluid is part of the neuroendocrine system. So if you don't drink enough water, then your brain literally dehydrates. So they did a study with water to see which organs were damaged when you don't get enough water and they were quite surprised to find out that the only thing that was affected was your mood. So when you are dehydrated, you become very moody, irritable, angry, and act out. So if your <laughs> friend or colleague or a lover is irritable, you may want to tell them, how about a nice glass of water? <laughs> It may be too late at that point. 
he needs, he needs to hydrate himself on a chronic basis. <laughs> I, I have to agree with you 100% on that. We see so many patients in the uh, age group over 65 and over who are chronically dehydrated. And for, for a host of reasons. One, they don't like to drink. Uh, two, if they drink a lot, they have to get up to urinate a lot. In the day, some of them may have bladder problems, may or may have prostate problems that cause them to have frequent mm -hmm. urination, and they're afraid of drinking. And then, of course, at night, uh, they don't drink. Uh, because they're afraid to drink because they have to get up too many times to urinate. So we see a lot of dehydration. And as you mm -hmm. correctly pointed out, dehydration is a major, major contributor uh, of not feeling well. Exactly. So in Chinese medicine, they noticed that after the age of 50, the function of the kidneys starts to diminish. So there's a particular formula called Romania 6 or Lue Di Wang Wan, which they just take on a regular basis as a preventive or a prophylaxis. So I put all my patients over 50 on this Chinese herbal formula to maintain their kidney strength so that they can drink three liters of water a day. So what I tell people, you need to drink one liter the first hour, you need to drink a half a liter every hour for five hours, and then you need to drink two six ounce cups of tea before and after each meal. And that way you will ensure that you get enough water. Now, if you're, if you're, let's say you wake up at eight and five hours later, it would be three in the afternoon. So you don't have to drink water at night. If you, if you get your two liters in during the day, right. and then you get your two six ounce cups of tea before and after each meal. <laughs> So that you don't have to worry about getting up late at night. Yeah. So not, not to be a devil's advocate here, but uh, uh, always try to balance stuff. And I always tell folks, one size doesn't fit all. So while what you are saying is correct, I've had patients who do that and overdo it and they develop what is called water intoxication and they get dilutional uh, sodium in there bloodstream, so they have something we call hyponatremia. And I've had one person when I was in New York who used to come in chronically to the emergency room uh, with seizures. And it was because his sodium became too so low because he got water intoxication. So while I agree with what you're saying, we always have to balance things and always individualize it. And let patients know if you have medical conditions or you're predisposed to certain things, we need to tailor this formula that you gave to individualize it. That's all. Okay. That, that sounds like excellent advice if you're treating an individual patient, but you and I are here just as a general to whoever's listening. Yeah. So and, I'm and still in practice. Tip. Yeah. That was just a tip, a general mm -hmm. tip, but I am still in private practice. I have no intention of retiring for the next 20 years. So <laughs> you can contact me for individual consultation, no matter where you are in the world. Dr. George Love. <laughs> Definitely. No, great responses. I, um, I, I want, and it's a simple thing, but it's so important. And if it's not in place, it, every, nothing else is in balance, right? And so uh, we wanted to bring that up first. Um, I'd like to um, roll back over the mindset, the, the role the mind plays in a healthy lifestyle. And I want you guys to really dig in, science, experience, um, because we know that, I, I, I feel that we have a lot to learn here, okay? I'm gonna start with Dr. Love on this one, please. Okay, well, you, you just hit my strike zone because this is my, particular field of expertise. <laughs> um, they, they say the spiritual life begins at 50 only because we're so caught up with uh, working and family duties and child rearing and making sure our kids get into college and get married properly. So we don't really get a chance to take time for ourselves until the age of 50. 
But if you're that rare individual where you do have time to take for yourself, then your emotional balance has got to be number one. Now in Chinese medicine, we know that anger injures the liver, worry injures the digestive system, uh, fear injures the kidneys, sadness enters the heart and grief enters the lungs. So we know that there are physiological reactions to staying in emotional states that I call emotional constipation. And we also <laughs> have that one friend who has emotional diarrhea and everything is a tragedy or impending doom or the sky is falling. So as the average person swings back before these two extremes, there is a physiological toll. So how do you get control of your mind to balance your emotions so that you can have a healthy and happy lifestyle? Well, the number one thing to do is meditation. And the number one thing that people are afraid of is meditation. meditation. So most people don't know anything about meditation. They may go on YouTube and watch somebody uh, teach meditation, or they might buy meditation music, uh, or they might buy a meditation video, or they might listen to some guided meditation. But in my experience, none of that is as effective as if you have an actual teacher. So I teach eight different methods of meditation. And the easiest way I call sleepitation. So when you go to sleep, your heart rate naturally slows down. Your respiration rate naturally slows down. Your muscles relax. Your brain waves slow down. And then your spine actually elongates. So I give you affirmations and visualizations, visualizations to do while you are falling asleep. And then I tell you to keep a journal so when you wake up, you can write down what you were thinking and what you were feeling. And in this journal, you are able to write affirmations. You are able to write mantras to clear your mind. And so this whole practice, it takes about two weeks for me to teach one person the whole thing because you have to go to sleep in order to practice it. So it takes about 14 <laughs> nights for me to train you in this process. Mm. But at the end of the 14 days, one of the eight methods that I teach is going to connect with you, is going to click with you, and that's the one you're going to do for the rest of your life. One. That Mark. is so true what you have said. I'm so sorry that you're far removed geographically where I'm located because I have a lot of patients that I would love to refer to you because I firmly believe in uh, what you've said because stress is such a major contributor of poor health and disease. And I try to tell my patients every day when they come to me and say, Doc, I'm stressed out. I said, whoa, hold on a minute, you know, your job isn't stressing you out, the boss isn't stressing you out, all stress is internally generated by one's own attitude, the way you handle something. It is not the life events that really uh, cause us to be stressed out, it's the way we react to it, and that brings on a cascade of events and internal secretion of hormones and toxic material and substances that make us ill. Almost every disease that we see with the exception of trauma and traumatic you know, inflict afflictions, uh, stress has a major role. My asthmatic patients, when they're under stress, they get exacerbations. My bad diabetic patients, when they're under stress, the sugar goes up. Cardiovascular mm. patients, when they're under stress, end up with major heart attacks and on, and I could go on and on and on. Mm. So what you said- well, I'm not that far from you, uh, Dr. Nanan, because we're on <laughs> together right now, and I'm in Florida, and you're in Florida, so- Oh, you are in Florida. I didn't know yes. that. I thought you were in New York. No, I, I see the coconut I, palm in the back of you. Where in Florida are you? I'm in Delray Beach. Oh, Delray. Oh, that's not it's, far away. Not then. Far so enough. Get your phone number uh, before we end the session because Absolutely. that's not very far. I'm in Fort Lauderdale. 
Absolutely. Okay. And I can share, I can text you the phone number. Very yes, good. thank, thank right you. Top uh, of my phones right now. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> You're my right frequent colleagues. Right on target. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to share, Dr. Nanana? Uh, did we interrupt you? You were done with the. Well, I, I'm so happy to hear Dr. Love. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, uh, you know, copy from what Dr. Wheel said that. Uh, as we mm -hmm. are growing older, he used to, uh, I, I guess, Dr. I Love said start at 50. So as we all, if you wish, tend to grow older at 50, we need to discover the benefits that aging can bring, which we tend to forget. I mm -hmm. see that you had on your uh, list of panel talking ageism, which is so sad uh, how we treat mm -hmm. patients who are uh, aging. But uh, Dr. Wheel thinks, that as we age, we must learn to enjoy the benefits that aging uh, can bring to us, like wisdom, depth of character, the smoothing out of what was once rough and harsh, and of mm -hmm. course, the evaporation of what's inconsequential, and of course, the concentration of true worth mm -hmm. that we look forward to. And of course, this will make us happy. We need to be happy. That's one of the reasons why we're here, to happy and to contribute to the evolution of the world. Mm -hmm. So it is important. Enjoy good food, good friends, laughter. And as Deepak Chopra said, let your life be a journey without a destination. And my recipe that I tell my patients to be happy is to cleanse your heart of any hate, free your mind, from worry. And that's where you come in, Dr. Love. Mm -hmm. You've got to teach patients that. Live simple. Many of us live too much of a complex life. We got to mm -hmm. live simple and we don't give enough. We have to give more and expect less. And if we follow those four simple rules, five simple rules, we'd be happy. Right. Wonderful. I love it. So, I'm actually like relaxing just with you two. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, through the screen, you're know, making community. It's uh, it's interesting. It really is interesting. Um, I want to dig in a little bit more on ageism now. Um, seeing as how we're looking at uh, black seniors uh, as a and black and Caribbean seniors as a target group. Um, in your pra and first of all, let's talk about what what is considered ageism. There's, there's that first I wanted to look at. So um, Dr. Love, uh, could you share a little bit more about ageism? What do you feel it is or what the experiences are based on ageism? So I, I ask people, would you rather have a ton of wrinkles and be able to move anywhere you want without pain or would you rather have a perfect face and walk with a cane? And they all say, I'd rather be able to move freely and have wrinkles than to not have wrinkles right. and unable to move. So right. age is based upon your ability to move. Right. Now, I grew up in New York and there was always that one guy who was clearly over 70, had a cane, and yet he could move and he was, he was like the, that guy. <laughs> you know? And everybody's like, when I grow up, I want to be just like him. And that's what I was thinking when I was in my 20s. I was like, when I get to be old, I want to be just like that guy. I want to be able to move like that. And that always stayed with me. When I was 32, I went to a roller skating rink <laughs> for the first time at, uh, since, a, since a kid. Um, so I'm at the roller rink and there was this guy there around 50 who was, he was built like this. And I was fascinated by this guy. So eventually I made friends with him and I said, everybody here is like 20 something and you're 50 something. He said, I made a decision when I got married that I wanted to choose an activity that I would always be able to do even when I got old. And that was roller skating. He said, mm -hmm. you go to the gym. He said, by the time you hit 50 in a gym, people are looking at you weird, you know? So who's got time for 18 holes of golf? 
you know, unless you have it like that. So he chose roller skating, that stuck in my head. And then when I learned Qigong, I realized that roller skating is a type of Qigong. It's moving in a very rhythmic pattern with rotational joint movements. So if you learn Qigong, you can make roller skating your Qigong. So those two things stuck in my head, the, the ability to move and then the ability to move with strength and power. So I will never get old, mainly because I keep my spirit young, but secondly, because I move two, three hours a day. I make it a point to think about moving. What makes people old is when they lose the flexibility in their bodies, they become stiff physically, but they also become stiff mentally. Right. And that's what young people flip out about old people because they are inflexible in their thinking. Mm -hmm. So the only way to stay young is to hang out with young people <coughs> and keep your mind open and flexible. Wonderful, wonderful. That, that came up in our earlier um, panel and it, it had more to do with uh, actually part of mental health was keeping a mind that's flexible and learning new things and applying yeah. new knowledge. Applying new knowledge, yes. Very much is. as we did when we were young. So it's pretty, it's on the same line. So thank you. And um, Dr. Nanan, would you like to uh, chime in on ageism? Sure, sure. Well, first, let me say, ageism <laughs> is a bigger problem than many people think it is. Okay, if you look at the strict definition of ageism, it's the stereotyping and discrimination of people because of their age. And it is extremely prevalent. Extre and there are many reasons for it. And what, what we forget is that the fastest growing segment of our population is people over 65. Yep. And we need to instill change, change in the mindset of, in our population. Uh, that ageism is very rampant. In fact, there was a study done uh, where ageism was found to be more prevalent than, believe it or not, than sexism or racism combined. Mm -hmm. So it is not a simple problem. It is a big problem. And we need to make our population aware of it. We need to teach this to our younger ones uh, mm -hmm. and adults, because in our society, I'm not saying everyone, but certainly in many, many cases, if not the majority, where we just put our uh, Asian parents in homes and we feel we've done our part and we pay the monthly fee to the home and we don't visit them. Uh, the only time they visit them is in the emergency room when they come in with a stroke and we get a call from California or from New York or Maine, uh, what, what's mm -hmm. happening to my uh, father, what's happening to my mother. They were neglected completely. And uh, this seems to, uh, be a big problem in our society. Ageism is not being addressed to its fullest, and we need to do that. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, very, and uh, you definitely uh, touched on something I wanted to, to open with that question. You both did, and you did it beautifully, so thank you very much. I, I want to pivot and um, talk more about alternative medicine and um, in particular, I wanted us to take a look at uh, the trend of acceptance of alternative med uh, medicine. And I'd like to discuss what you think about this. But, and I'd like to start with Dr. Nanan. But Dr. Nanan, I really want you to do something, a small thing first. Um, I know of Dr. Weil, and you've mentioned him when it came to ageism. If you could share a little bit more about integrative medicine and Dr. Weil. Uh, because I was in Arizona when he was first, you know, unfolded and unpacked mm -hmm. the integrative medicine. And uh, so I just really wanted everyone to have a little bit more information about him and about integrative medicine. And then I'm going to, so, and then you can talk more about the trends toward more, more alternative medicines in the medical industry. Okay. Oh, certainly. Well, first <laughs> of all, uh, let me say we don't like the term alternative medicine. Alternative medicine gives Thank people you. the impression that it's I one or the other. 
you yes. either want mainstream medicine or you want some other alternative. That's not how it ought to be. What I like and what Dr. Wee likes, and I learned it from him uh, uh, more than a decade ago, is integrative medicine. Mm -hmm. Because there are many ways I learned in medical school, there are many ways to skin a cat, okay, probably. Uh, so we are trained, I was trained initially uh, in Western medicine. But as time moved on, I started to embrace other forms of medicine. I started with Ayurvedic medicine. I went into a little bit of uh, TCM, Chinese traditional uh, Chinese medicine, a uh, little bit of energy medicine. And I am self-taught in these things. I learned a lot. There are many ways to handle a patient's uh, medical problems. And to get to the root of it, we need to embrace all the various branches of medicine, if you wish, okay? And for reasons which are obvious in the Western world, we have only embraced Western medicine for, for too long. And it's refreshing that within the past maybe decade or decade and a half maybe, that we are starting to embrace what you refer to as alternative medicine, but it's not alternative medicine, it's not one or the other. And when my patients come to me, I am upfront with them. And I said, let me know what herbs you are taking, what supplements you are taking, because I want to make sure that you are getting the right herbs and supplements and it's not going to interfere with some of the other uh, medications that I'm giving you. And their eyes are open wide because if I had asked them that initially, they would not tell me that they're taking them. But when I open up to them and let them know this is okay. This is just another form of medicine. And we need to always integrate all of this. The same thing with through Ayurvedic medicine, with Chinese PCM medicine, herbal medicine, energy medicine, uh, like Barbara Eden is good at, all of these things. So I like the term integrative medicine. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, Dr. Um, Love, could you speak a little bit more on... Um, on the trends toward people. I see that, first of all, I hear Dr. Nanan is saying that he as a doctor has, is, is approaching it and opening it more with his patients. But are there any other trends that um, we're seeing when it comes to integrative medicine, uh, particularly as it regards the geriatric community? And okay, I've got a lot to say about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, a lot I to made say. it. <laughs> I, I'm going to try to concise it, uh, make it concise. Okay. okay. Western medicine has testing, it has drugs, and it has surgery. Mm. There's very little uh, therapy that Western mm. medicine has. So if someone goes for weight loss, other than prescribing a pill, Western medicine doesn't have a lot of answers for that. For, for geriatric uh, medicine, all they can do is offer pills or drugs. They can't offer massage. They cannot offer gait training. They cannot offer stretching classes. That's something that you have to pursue on your own. If you have a, an enlightened uh, family doctor, which of, of, of which there's a good 30% of family doctors are enlightened. So I'm not trying to paint a brush that doctors are bad. Doctors are, my cousin, both of my cousins and two of my uncles are medical doctors. So I grew up in a medical family. I decided to pursue Chinese medicine, and Tibetan medicine, and for lack of a better term, Asian medicine, uh, because I knew from family conversations that drugs don't always work and surgeries don't always work. And these things are fairly expensive to the black community and especially the geriatric community. So we can't afford to take chances with our elders. Plus there's the elephant in the room that says health disparity along racial lines. So there is a bias, and I'm not saying that doctors are racist. I'm just saying that there is a racial bias. 
So there was a study done where they, they took a group of doctors who swore that they were not racist and they tested how much time they spent with their white, black, and Latino patients. And they found out that the average white patient they spent 15 minutes talking to and the average black and Latino patient they spent six minutes talking to. So then they called the doctors in and they said, you said you're not racist, but you spent triple the time with your white patients versus your black and Latino patients. And the doctor said, well, they didn't ask me questions. And so the, 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 the board said, since they didn't ask the questions, why didn't you offer? Your, your other patients asked you questions. You could have offered that information without being asked. And they said, ah, we don't know. So that is a racial disparity in healthcare. And elders were taught not to question authority. Right. What's like that? So when, when, when a geriatric patient goes in, he's not asking any questions because he's taught not to. And the doctor says, do this, I'm going to do that. Whereas other ethnic groups are always taught to question authority. Now, I was fortunate. Both my parents were educators. And my father said, question authority, always question authority. If they tell you to do something, say why. And if you don't understand the answer, make them tell you why again. So I pretty much lived my life that way. So I don't get to run around. And I'm a health advocate for not only my patients, but my friends and their parents as well. So the, the issue for geriatrics is you need to know your own body. You cannot assume that the doctor is going to explain to you 12 years of biology, anatomy, and physiology. That's something you should actually know before you go into the doctor. If you're having trouble breathing, you should be able to say right side, left side, upper lung, lower lung. If you're laying down and you're breathing, you should be able to tune into your own body. So health literacy is one of my pet peeves. So you, the patient, need to go to someone like me who's going to teach you some basic anatomy and physiology. And I can do that in 30 minutes or less. I can tell you all your organs and how they work and what's the most important thing you should know about that. I can do that in 30 minutes. Now you have to go home and breathe and meditate and walk and swim and dance and then see how you feel and make notes, keep a journal so that if and when you do get sick, then you know exactly what's wrong. So people say my stomach and your stomach is above the belly button, yet the pain is in the lower right quadrant. <laughs> well, that's my stomach. No, your stomach is up here. Well, I didn't know that. Well, that's not the doctor's fault that you didn't know that. It's not your parents' fault. It's not the high school's fault. That's your fault. You should have investigated how your body works. And YouTube University is full of videos on each organ and how they work. So health literacy is point number health one. Uh, point number two, acupuncture is a tool. There's a science behind acupuncture. So you wouldn't call the car mechanic the wrench man, and you wouldn't call the carpenter the saw man. So diminishing what I do and reducing it to the name of one of my 10 tools is demeaning to me. So don't call me an acupuncturist. I'm a doctor of the science of how energy moves through your body. And the Chinese call that meridian therapy. And there's eight different methods of moving energy through the body. Acupuncture is only one of them. Okay? So if the public understood that there's a science, they're like, I don't like acupuncture because I don't like metal objects sticking in my body. Hey, who wants that? I don't want a metal object stuck in my body. And yet, 
you get injections from hypodermic needles whenever they tell you you need to get one. In fact, you will volunteer <laughs> for a blue shot or any other shot because they said so. But uh, you don't yeah. want to come to me. So that's my second pet peeve. Okay. <laughs> okay. My third one is people reject Western medicine because their aunt died or their grandmother died or their mother died or whatever. That's like throwing the baby out with the bat bath water. If I get run over by a truck, do not take me to the acupuncturist. <laughs> to the hospital, please. So I'm, I'm, I'm not negating Western medicine. But, but as we age, the aging process, that is heart disease, which is the number one cause of death, which is uh, diabetic, diabetic complications, which is the new uh, number two cause of death, I'm sorry, number three, all cancers are two cause of death. So let me back up and, and clarify. So heart attack is number one, stroke is number two, high blood pressure is number three. Mm -hmm. Together, that's one, but that's how the Department of Health, Edu Health Education and Welfare breaks it down. Then number two is all cancers, and number three is diabetic complications. The top five cancers are lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Those five make up 52% of all cancers. So if we changed our behavior for lung cancer, which would be quit smoking, start exercising. For uh, breast cancer, stop wearing too tight bras and exercise and stop smoking. And uh, colon cancer, drink more water, eat more fiber. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, prostate cancer, stop eating big meals at night and trying to have sex with your wife. You wouldn't eat a big meal and play football or soccer. So why would you eat a big meal and then want to have sex? That makes no sense. <laughs> so <laughs> exercise first, then eat. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you're feeling me. And number five, pancreatic cancer comes from not eating enough raw food. Mm -hmm. eating too much restaurant food and not enough raw food. That's the cause of pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. So if we just changed our behavior, you wouldn't even need to see a doctor for any of that because prevention is the only real cure is prevention. Okay. Wow. So, so we're talking about trending. Okay. Mm -hmm. The current status is when I get sick, I'm going to go to the doctor. But for black males over the age of 50, if I get a leg cramp, I'm not going to the doctor until I can no longer walk. Mm -hmm. If my shoulder hurts, I am not going to the doctor until I can't lift my arm over my head. Then maybe I'll go to the doctor, okay? So black men, as a general rule, wait until it's too late Yes. So it can't be fixed. Then right. you need drugs and surgery at that point. That's the only thing that's going to work at that point. Right. So, so we, the elder community, has to be taught when they're 30 and 40 how to be proactive. Okay. So saying exercise is important doesn't make sense. You have to say, if you exercise your shoulders... You won't get a shoulder impingement. You won't tear your ACL. And then you'll be able to button your shirt when you're 85. So you have to explain why each exercise works. And that's what I do in my Qigong class. I explain each movement, which muscle, which joint, and how that exercise will prevent XYZ dis-ease. So that's right. education. That takes me back to my first point of health literacy. You have to learn how your body works before mm -hmm. you go to a doctor. 
Okay. <laughs> All so right. I'm, I'm going to shut up now. And let's... <laughs> no, I, yeah, I'd love you came back to the first point. Um, and, you know, um, you've also kind of answered my what I was going to close with. So that it's actually divine order. I know Dr. Nanan has a hard stop here. Um, and that was uh, how to think about, I wanted to, I want to talk about how fitness trainers should think about uh, uh, the effect of work, effectively working with Black, Black and Caribbean seniors. And I think you nailed it when you said uh, health literacy and the way you un I'll unpack that is really the way a fitness trainer uh, or people who are working with the wellness of Black and Caribbean elders really have to approach it. Uh, the issue of, of, of authority and how we were taught to, to, to uh, interact with authorities like doctors and so forth, and also understanding the body, come to, come to the floor understanding the body or asking for help to understand the body. And uh, fitness trainers need to be a part of that piece. So thank you so much, Dr. Love. Um, so we're about to close and I want to give you both, uh, an opportunity to kind of share your, your information with the community who might want to, to uh, reach out and contact you. Uh, this is going to be recorded. Uh, it's going to be uploaded onto Facebook and also uploaded into YouTube so people can see this over and over and over again. So this is a good time for people, for people to be able to capture that information. And I'd like to start with you, uh, Dr. Nanan. Uh, just how can people reach you uh, if they're interested in your services? Okay. Uh, let me just say, uh, Dr. Lab, I just wanted to comment on some of the points you made a little. Oh, Not of opposing them, just reinforcing them. You started off talking about uh, racism and doctors who didn't think they were racist, but when they analyzed the tendencies pointed toward racism. Mm -hmm. It is well established now by even high authorities, the American Medical Association has accepted that there is built-in systemic racism in medicine. Pretty much everybody agrees with that, even at the level of the president, the new, newly elected president Biden has put number one of his uh, actions to take is to try to decrease the systemic racism that exists in this country. So that is being addressed. Hopefully, you know, we'll do it. It's not easily done, and it may take longer than you in my lifetime, but nevertheless. And then you touched on the point where white doctors would speak to uh, black patients or non-white patients in a shorter time than they would with, let's say, white patients. Uh, what I teach my students when I taught intense and residence in New York and when I, do, I, when I teach the, res, the students here at the Atlantic, Atlantic Institute of Oriental Medicine is talk to your patients. The definition of a physician means a teacher. You have to teach your patients about health. You have to teach them about what you're knowledgeable. Teach them what you think is wrong about them and give them choices. This is what I analyze is wrong with you, why you are not feeling well or what the specific complaint is and let them know what are the choices, how to correct this and how to avoid it in the future. Don't tell them you have A and X, here is a prescription for it, go home. That is what you alluded to. You have to question authority, but there's no need for that if we as medical right. practitioners are lumping you into this as well. Okay, so you're not exempt because you are in the medical field. We have to teach our patients. We are teachers, not healers. We have to teach them. And then when we, from our knowledge, we tell them what is wrong and how to correct it, give them choices and let them decide. Don't coerce a patient actually into a form of treatment like many doctors do because they make more out of that modality of treatment. And let's not fool ourselves, that happens. It happens in every field and certainly it happens in the medical field. And I question a lot of my colleagues about that. And when I teach now uh, with the, the Chinese doctors uh, or TCM doctors rather, a lot of them ask me about putting in this equipment and that equipment in the office. I said, whoa, be careful. You may say this is going to help your patients, but the more equipment you put, the more you're gonna use it because it's the income generators for you. And that's what you, you stay away from. 
only put in equipment that you think is going to help your patient and use it for that purpose only, not for income generating. A lot of them ask me that, and I tell them stay away from that. I see too much of that in Western medicine, so don't fall into that trap. Okay. Uh, you talk, touched about food, and I think it was you uh, that also mentioned about eating in the restaurant. We forget the importance of nutrition, and I can give you quotes from way back to Hippocrates, where let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food and so forth. I can give you lots of quotes. I tell this to my patients all the time. I said food and nutrition is extremely important. A lot of us, even in developed countries, are malnourished. I tell people obesity doesn't equal healthiness. It, you could be malnourished. In some ethnic uh, groups, when the kids are growing up, if they're fat and chubby, they're healthy. I tell them, no, that's wrong. Change that mindset. So there's a lot we teach our patients about nutrition. We have to teach. And I we tell patients, I said, prepare your food with love. That's what your mother and your grandmother did. That's why you grew up healthy. When you eat in too much restaurant food, nobody puts love into that, especially in mediocre restaurants and fast food restaurants. It's to make a buck, okay? Even in the Bible, you know that man shall not live by bread alone, okay? There is something called the life force in food. And food is merely the vehicle for bringing and nourishing that life force within you. And you, you know this very well, uh, being, uh, you know, with Chinese medicine and the Qi, Ayurvedic medicine, it's the life force, it's the same thing, okay? So we need to eat nutritious food, and I can talk for hours and hours on that because I do lecture on that quite a lot, but time permitting, I can't get into it. But I encourage patients to eat fresh food as much as possible. You don't have to go all the way for organic. You know, only some foods organic, and prepare the food with love and share it to your family. Number one. Number two. Uh, make sure that you get this information about what is good nutrition, because a lot of patients out there, a lot of the population, don't know what good nutrition is. You touched on on fluid intake and proper hydration. But there's so much more about the actual breakdown of the food and the substances they're getting. We also, as we are talking about aging population, as a population ages, they don't digest the food as well. They don't absorb the nutrients as well. And I encourage them, as opposed to my colleagues in Western medicine, you must, must take supplements. And I have long lists of supplements that I recommend to them that they must take because I think you wanted to talk about age and the physical changes. I can talk for two hours on that if you want, okay? But aging goes all the way back to the cellular level and, and even the smallest particle in the cell, the mitochondria, which generates our energy. As we age, that becomes sluggish. There are a lot of supplements out there that we can, rev up our mitochondria and energy producing uh, uh, capacity. Not only that, we can take other supplements to actually increase the biogenesis of these energy uh, producing organelles like the mitochondria. And I can go on and on on that. But so I teach my patients about these supplements. They say, but my doctor said I don't need supplements if I eat well. I said, that's hogwash. You cannot eat well enough because one, the quality of food that we have is not like what our great grandparents had. Number two, as we age, the capacity to absorb this food is impaired. So we need the supplements. And I teach them about supplements and I tell them where to go and get good prices and so forth that are good quality supplements. But maybe at another forum, we can address that. So maybe I'll conclude with that, that as patients age, not only do they have to exercise physically, they have to exercise their brain because what good is your physical activity if you have Alzheimer's or dementia, okay? And dementia is so widespread. And again, I can talk about that you know, for hours. Uh, of course, Alzheimer's is the, well, the more common type of dementia, but there are many, many other types of dementia. And we want to preserve our mind. We want to avoid dementia, okay? And then, of course, we want to nourish our spirit and soul. And I'm not talking about religion here. 
People think I go to church every Sunday and I find I'm spiritual. No, you are not. You're not spiritual. Okay. Not, I'm not against religion. I go to church myself. Okay. But I'm saying there's a difference between religion and spirituality. So I want my patients to understand as you advance in age, like I said earlier, learn to embrace what you can get from aging with that wisdom uh, that you can get and take care of your body. Keep moving. That's the buzzword in the new millennium. The more you move, the better you are. The more sedentary you are, the sicker you get. I am not a big advocate for my elderly patients in gyms because I'll tell you, I had a patient who was in his 80s, uh, walked every day and was very healthy. He moved to a community where they had a gym built in and it's free. So he said, I'm going to go to the gym. Make a long story short, he fell dead on the treadmill. He wasn't used to a treadmill. Okay. Uh, so I tell my patients, if you want to go and work out in a gym, consult with your medical practitioner, whoever it is. Doesn't necessarily have to be a Western medical practitioner, a medical practitioner. Just consult with them and know what your limitations are because you don't want to injure yourself more. You want to help yourself more. So exercise, exercise. Yes, keep moving. Eat healthy. Educate yourself on nutrition. Know what's good for you and get your supplements in. We can prevent dementia with good food and supplements. We can increase longevity with some supplements. There are many uh, gerontologists now who uh, have evidence to show that 100 is easily attainable and people, we're gonna have more centurions coming up in the next decade or so than we've ever had in our lifetime in this country. So with that, I'm going to end and good luck to everybody. And those How of you- How can we contact you? How can we contact you? You have such knowledge. Well, by email, snannanmd at yahoo.com. You have my email. That would be the best way to contact okay. me because I, like I said, I teach and I also uh, work at a free clinic. We have a free clinic in Fort Lauderdale for patients who have no insurance. We mm -hmm. see patients uh, who have no insurance. You must be a resident of Broward County to qualify. You can work, but you can make a lot of money. You can't have money like Trump, okay? So. <laughs> All right, you ain't got much money really either. But so you must be a resident and you must have absolute new, no insurance. Otherwise we get into trouble with the, uh, you know, the, the medical society for taking okay. away the bread and butter. Okay. So that's what I do pretty much full time and teach. Wonderful. So email is Thank the best so way to contact me. And then of course I can contact email patients. Best. Uh, or right. whoever wish to get some advice from me. And it's free. I don't charge. Okay. And you, Dr. George, I will reach you. I'm sure, Dr. Love, I will reach you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nana. My pleasure, anytime. Dr. Love, how can we reach you? Okay. So the best way to reach me is directly by phone or text 561-502-6200. And I teach a daily exercise class in Delray Beach. And if Delray is too far, you can go to lovechigong.com and join the class online. Um, every Friday, the class is free on YouTube. It's called Share Qigong with the World. Uh, so you can go to youtube.com, put in Share Qigong with the World. It should pop up. If not, my, my uh, link is... Dr. Chi Love, D R Q I L O V E. So, Dr. Chi Love on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So, you can find me in all those places, or you can text me if you want to have an online consultation. And if you want to take the daily class, go to lovechigong.com and you can register for the class right there. Dr. Love, could you repeat the telephone number again for me, please? Area code 561 502. Six two zero zero. Thank you so much. Wonderful, so. wonderful. So, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate um, you giving me giving us all this wisdom uh, of your experience. Um, I um, want to wish you all well in all of your endeavors. 
I want you to know that uh, what you say and what we do and where it's going to be placed on YouTube and Facebook will impact lives. It will impact the elders that I reach out to, as well as the fitness trainers groups that I also engage with. Uh, so it's, it's really valuable information. As we know, uh, elders are uh, rolling themselves out, emerging from this pandemic. One of the things we can be ready to do is to change the trajectory of their lives by injecting health and wellness in it in a measuring way, in ways that help them understand their bodies, as you all have, have stated, and, um, and understanding that uh, this is for longevity, right? And having a clear sense of, of, the, of the connection between health, nutrition, water, fitness, and a long physical life. So uh, you guys have saved some lives today. I'm, I'm <coughs> confident that you have, and I truly appreciate the time with you. So I'm gonna be closing out. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and take you guys out of the room because you don't need to sit here looking at me. Uh, even I got a <laughs> while well, I talk, uh, talk, you know. So I'm gonna say so long. Thank you all. Live a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. It, my, it was all pleasure being with you. All right. So long, doctors. Bye okay. now. Good afternoon, everyone. So we've come to the end of the first virtual Black Senior Fitness Fair. It's been wonderful. I really, really hope you're able to get some takeaways from this and, and that you find some things that help you live a better, healthy life, a life full of increased health, vigor, and longevity. So to summarize today, we really learned a lot about the capacity of people to age and age well. We saw beautiful elders who gave us wonderful tips on how to bring health and wellness into our lives and how to maintain health and wellness. We also uh, had honesty about uh, some of the challenges of aging, but also tips for moving around. We learned uh, some, some more about integrative medicine and how Western medicine is not the only way to maintain our health. So before signing off, I want to take time to thank our guests. Like I have been saying on Facebook, I'm bringing to you all some of the baddest, baddest elders in the world. First, I want to thank our featured guest, Ernestine Shepherd. I'd like to thank our Underneath the Village Tree speakers, we need Barbia Williams, Nick Savage, and Chris Dora. I'd like to also thank our panelists, Dr. Adebihi, Adebihi Banjoko, Renita Alexander, Alan Burgess, Dr. Selva Nanan, and Dr. George Love. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, partners, and collaborators. This is brought to you with the support of Healthier Neighbors in West Palm Beach, Community Partners of South Florida. Also like to thank Village Tree Enterprises, Dope Trifecta Media, Earth Earthiopia Works, Savage Flight Fitness, and the Odd Job Lady. Uh, the Fitness Fair team was Jessica, who was our production manager, Emmeline, our production assistant, Joshua Sarah, our graphic specialist, and Mariara Gregory, our technical media support. So now we invite both Black, both black African-American, and senior elders, uh, seniors, and uh, and fitness professionals to join our Facebook group. You can do that on Facebook um, because we really are looking forward to bringing together a community of people who are poised to step into both the need as well as the prosperity of serving our seniors in a better way to uh, transform this uh, preventive disease into health and longevity. So we want to really change the health narrative for our seniors. And that's what Silver Fox Elite Fitness Black Trainers Group is. It's take us taking responsibility for our community with our own skills. So check that out. Um, we also, I also have a YouTube channel where we'll be posting all of the, all of the, the different videos we saw today, as well as the event in its entirety will be posted on YouTube. And of course, we're gonna be having the watch party at 6 p.m. tonight. I'm gonna to tell you a little bit more about Silver Fox Elite Fitness. Um, 
I founded Soul Fox Elite Fitness um, at the, I leaned into the pandemic and what I was seeing was happening with the pandemic as a fitness trainer. And I felt that as the, the inequities began to reveal themselves, both in health and the outcomes of, of, prevent, of preventive medicine and its connection to high levels of mortality among Black people, I just really started wanting to wrap my mind around Who's going to take care of this? And I decided that it's me and by extension, the community from which it is impacted, which is the community I'm from. So I formed Civil Fox Elite Fitness with a goal of moving, removing barriers, regardless of social economic conditions for elders moving toward their vets, right? Mind, body, spirit, right? Um, I call that foxifying or getting your foxy back. Because Foxy is not a look, it's an attitude, an attitude of confidence, an attitude of being at, at, at rest and at peace in the world, a commitment to self-help and self-wealth, and, and definitely a commitment to connecting to family and community. So Silver Fox now offers mobile and virtual fitness, and it's designed to meet the needs of active seniors. You can check out the website www.civilfoxelitefitness.com to learn more and to register for classes. Um, beginning Monday, we'll be taking the price down to $15 a class for until the end of March. So you might want to wait till Monday to do that. Um, we also have personalized fitness membership. Um, Dr. Nanan stated that he doesn't like gyms for, for elders. One of the things I, we wanted to do with Silver Fox Elite Fitness was to go directly to seniors. Right, we couldn't do it because of the pandemic, and we do it virtually. But we, we will be go we go directly to the seniors or meet them in spaces that are near them in order to break down the ge geographic barrier. Uh, so in 2021, Silver Fox will be rolling out uh, more Silver Sneakers discounts. Uh, we're going to have a train the trainer uh, program in which uh, we are going to be providing assistance for those who are age 40 and older to become trainers, providing wraparound services and helping with tuitions and so forth. Um, we're also gonna start the Silver Fox Walking Club as we get a little warmer. Um, and we're going to be having dance classes, African and Caribbean dance for seniors. And Dr. George Love will be providing us Kegon for seniors. I've heard it's wonderful. It's like uh, Kegon on cane, Kegon in chair. So we're gonna be uh, doing that for Dr. George Love. So to contact me, I am Geneva Gregory Fall. You can call me at 954-860-5991. You can email me, Geneva, that's D-J-E, N as in Nancy, A, B as in boy, A, at silverfoxelitefitness.com. So my final words. Addressing the fitness and health needs for our Black seniors is an act of Sankofa. We are called to reach back and connect to what has not been done. We were not able to always push beyond the generational information we had regarding how we should eat, how we should behave, how we should maintain our health. But our seniors remain vital to sustaining the threads of experience in our communities. And from these threads, that's how we form the fabric of the African descended culture. And it is through culture, we define everything we are to a world. So that's it. I want you, everyone to have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day and every day afterwards. I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. I'm your host, Jennifer Gregory Fall signing off for the first virtual Black Senior Fitness Fair. Be well.